All right, so we're going to look back and kind of move on to the next thing. This actually should be similar to mitosis, but will be a little bit different. So let's start with an essential question. We'll keep it basic here. What is mitosis? And then we want to know what its role is, and so, and what is its role? in sexual reproduction. Okay. There we go. Oh, I said mitosis. Oh my goodness, I was thinking mitosis. This is already a fun video. <laughs> this is not bode well for the rest of it. It is myosis. <laughs> ah, okay, I'm not even going to fix it. It's the blooper reel as part of what we're doing. So you got this. So what is meiosis? And it's meiosis. This is going to be fun. We're going to tough this one out together. So in humans, we have somatic cells. And they have 46 chromosomes. And they'll form 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes. So we'll talk about that. 23 pairs of homologous. Then como means the same. Okay. So they're going to have same types of chromosomes. Your somatic cells are non-sex cells. So these are going to be anything that's not egg or sperm, really. So hair, skin, nails, eyeballs, blood, muscles, bone, bone marrow, I mean, just think about nerve cells. Those are all somatic cells because they're not sex cells. And so they have uh, 46 chromosomes. So homologous chromosomes, to go in more detail here, are matched in length. They're matched in their centromere position. So they have a little thing where, if you remember, woo, during my mitosis, they had a little thing where our sister chromatids were attached at the centromere at the little middle point. So that's our centromere. They're going to match at that. Because actually we get some that are pretty, like, they have one side is longer than the other. I know this is a terrible picture, but I'm saying there's, there's centromere is, like, way up here. Okay. Not in the center. They also have a similar staining pattern. Okay. And that staining pattern really is associated with a locus. Okay. That's a good term. Uh, pluralis loci. This is position of a gene. So really it's just location of a gene. It's like where that gene lives. It's kind of that gene's address. Like this particular locus, like if it's right here, on this particular chromosome, this section right here will code for eye color or whatever. Okay, so it's just where that gene lives. Different versions of a gene may be found at the same locus on two chromosomes of a homologous pair. Okay, so we get different versions of a gene. We're going to come to that. Okay. So the human sex chromosomes... X and Y differ in size and genetic composition. Okay. So we've got X and Y. Those are our sex chromosomes. The other 22 pairs that we talk about of, from, of homologous pairs are called autosomes. Okay. So 1 through 22 are our autosomes, and they'll be the same for both male and female. So we can kind of do that. They're same for all males and females. Okay. And then our 23rd pair may be mismatched depending, but that's our sex chromosomes and they'll actually determine uh, the gender. Okay. So here's kind of what we look at. Here's a pair of homologous duplicated, notice duplicated chromosomes. Each of these, this is not the best picture, but the idea is this here and this here are the homologous chromosomes, okay? So those are kind of our homologous chromosomes right here. But remember, during that S phase and during what we talked about last time, we actually have to make a copy of those chromosomes. We have to duplicate it. So we attach those just to keep track of it. So this side on both of them 
is the duplicated chromosome. So these are the sister chromatids and sister chromatids, you can see that here, chromatids are exact copies. Okay. Ta -da. So each half of this is an exact copy of the previous one. So an organism's life cycle is the sequence of stages leading from the adults of one generation to the adults of the next. And it's worth knowing. Humans and many animals and plants are diploid. I learned the word is diploid, so I say it diploid, but it makes sense to call it diploid because di is two. And ploid is going to refer to the sets of chromosome. So number of complete sets of chromosomes. So this is two sets of chromosomes. Because all somatic cells will contain a pair of homologous chromosomes. They, com they contain two complete sets. All right, we're going to go slow through this one. If I have to stop early and we talk about it in class, I probably will do that. Okay, so gametes, we have somatic cells, which are all the non-sex cells. The sex cells also get referred to as gametes. And you'll notice we have egg and sperm are our gametes. That's our only options for gametes. Okay, these guys are said to be haploid. I couldn't tell you what the ha means or ha means, but haploid means that there's a single set of chromosomes. All right, one set. So the human life cycle begins with a haploid sperm, because we just said that those were haploid, and it fuses with a haploid egg. So these have one set of chromosomes. That's how we usually write it, plus one M. And fertilization and then we form a zygote because we took one in and one in and we added those together and now with fertilization we have a zygote that's now diploid because one in plus one in is two in so I have two copies so mitosis of the zygote will then uh, and its descendants generates all the somatic somatic cells from the adult form Okay, so we'll kind of review this thing in class. There's an interesting thing about them. Mitosis keeps all that number the same, but meiosis will half it. Okay, so we have these multicellular diploid or diploid adults with two n just meaning two. And I'll show you because two is diploid are the copies of chromosomes. So n are our numbers of chromosomes. So or number of sets. Oh, can't run it up. Oh boy. My thing here doesn't like this. Number of sets of chromosomes. So both of these adults are 2N. We actually undergo meiosis, which is going to take us from 2N to 1N. There's only one way to do this. Okay, so through meiosis, we go from 2N adults to 1N egg and sperm, okay, those haploid gametes. When those things uh, fuse or fertilize and come together in fertilization, we then make a, zy a zygote that is 2N or diploid. We'll use mitosis in order to keep and preserve the same amount of genetics and make exact copies to go from 2N to 2N adults. So that's that life cycle. So to reiterate, gametes are made by meiosis in the ovaries and testes. Meiosis reduces the chromosome number by half. That's a key point. So we start out with a diploid organism with two complete sets of chromosomes. And by the end of meiosis, we're going to have one set of chromosomes in those cells. So we are halving the number of genetic material. Okay, so what we do is we start out with a pair of homologous chromosomes and a diploid parent cell. So they got both of these kind of chromosomes in there, but they're kind of similar. They get one from mom, one from dad. We kind of go through that S phase where we duplicate uh, the chromosomes. We duplicate the genetic material using kind of DNA replication. 
and we'll attach them together so that way we can keep track of them. So these are exact copies. These are duplicated homologous chromosomes. Okay. Eventually we're going to split them with meiosis 1 into separate cells, and then we'll do one more time. We'll split those guys into their sister chromatids, and we get haploid cells. Notice these have one in them. We started with two. So we have used two processes to half the amount of genetic material. And these won't be the same. All right. So we're going to go into meiosis in a little bit more detail, but we're at the 10-minute mark, so maybe it's a good time to take a break and then come back when you're ready. So meiosis is a type of cell division that produces haploid gametes in diploid organisms. Two haploid gametes may then combine in fertilization to re restore the diploid state of the zygote. Imagine if it didn't happen. We'd have to fertilize a diploid egg with another, the diploid sperm. So that's 2N plus 2N. We get 4N. Then from there, what do we get? 6N. It just, it would continue to add genetics. Okay. So meiosis and mitosis are preceded by duplication of chromosomes. That's that S phase. That's where we have DNA replication happen. Okay. However, meiosis is followed by two consecutive cell divisions. So, so we'll have two cell divisions. And mitosis only had the one. So this is a key difference. Because in meiosis, one duplication of chromosomes is followed by two divisions. So we duplicate the chromosomes one time and then we have two divisions, we're going to get four daughter cells with one haploid set of chromosomes. So this is another key point that we want as we move forward. We duplicate the chromosomes once, but then we split them twice. So interphase, like mitosis, meiosis is preceded by an interphase, during which the chromosomes duplicate. Right? Interphase, S phase, chromosomes duplicate. All right, now we get into the meat of meiosis and the key events that happen here. There's a lot, but we're going to kind of talk through them and work through them. And if this is as far as we make it, then we're doing pretty good. So we've got two phases. So the first part is meiosis one. We have to have this Roman numeral to tell us that this is the first time that it's going to happen. So the first one that happens, we'll have prophase 1. We have to specify that it's 1. In this, it should be similar. The nuclear envelope or membrane disappears. Our chromatin winds up, gets less spaghetti noodly, and becomes a very kind of visible, condensed chromosome. We actually have homologous chromosomes will kind of line up, each composed of two sister chromatids. They'll come together in pairs that are called a synapsis. So a synapsis is basically also what I know is kind of a tetrad because we're going to see four things together. Okay, we're going to see two sets of sister chromatids. So two sister chromatids. During synapsis, chromatids of homologous chromosomes exchange segments in a process called crossing over. We'll look at it. Okay. The chromosome tetrads then will move towards the center of the cell. So a lot. There's my thing. But this is sort of what it's looking like. So if you remember, we've got, we had one chromosome. Let's see if I can change colors. We have two chromosomes. But then we have to kind of make a copy. Because we have those, we're making a copy. Go back to blue. So now I have two copies of the same chromosomes, and these guys are all going to kind of stick together. Kind of like how we did our thing. We went on the hallway and we kind of stayed with our pairs. You know, these guys kind of have to stay in their kind of duplicated pairs. So if you see that, that's kind of what's happening here, is they're staying with their duplicated pairs, which we call tetrads, because there are four things involved. Tetra is four. All right. So, prophase, there we can see our tetrads all together there. Okay, and our nuclear envelope disappeared. We've got a little bit of crossing over that's occurring right here, which is exchanging genetic material, making it more um, 
more variation, which we'll talk about later. The next one is meiosis one, or in meiosis one is metaphase one. This is where the tetras will align in the equator. So similar to what we had before, we'll have things kind of line up here, but we've got four things lined up. And they'll be lined up together, but we'll still have okay, our kind of spindles moving those. But now we're moving one, two, three, four things. In anaphase, those homologous pairs separate, and they'll start moving towards opposite poles. Unlike mitosis, the sister chromatids making up each double chromosomes remain attached. So sister chromatids remain attached. So here's sort of what it looks like, is you can see these tetrans lined up in the center together. All four pieces are lined up there together. Okay. They've done a little bit of crossing over. They've exchanged some genetic material. Uh, that's happening there. You can actually see how it gives it a little genetic variation in anaphase, where these sister chromatids stay together, but they split. So our homologous pairs actually split. Okay. Telophase 1, still have to specify 1, the duplicated chromosomes have reached the poles, and then cytokinesis takes place along with it. So if we remember what's happening here, we're kind of moving these towards opposite poles. Okay, they're moving the opposite way. We start to reform our um, nucleus. We've got cytokinesis taking place where we're breaking those things in half. So there, or we break the kind of genetic, not the genetics, the cell materials, the cytoplasm in half. So this is going to be an interesting one to see if I can get my own vocabulary correct. You're welcome to check me on it, all right? So meiosis 2 follows meiosis 1 without chromosome duplication. That's a huge part. We're not duplicating the chromosomes again. We're taking whatever material is there and we're going to split it one more time. Okay? Each of the two haploid products enters meiosis 2. Two haploid products. This is a really weird one because it's they actually just have one genetic thing in them. Although there are sister chromatids attached together, they only have one. So technically entering into meiosis 2 they are haploid. That becomes a weird one to keep track of, so I'm not going to ask you to know that. You're going to be okay. Okay. So obviously, after following meiosis 1, we follow with meiosis 2, and so we'll start with prophase 2. I have to specify. The spindle forms and moves chromosomes towards the middle of the cell. Okay, just like we had before. Okay. Metaphase 2. Our duplicated chromosomes align in the center of the equator, like mitosis, going to look just like it. Anaphase, sister chromatids separate, just like they did before. Individual chromosomes move towards opposite poles. So what it looks like is here was the end of telophase 1 and cytokinesis. Now those guys are in separate cells. We lose the nuclear envelopes again. We condense them down a little bit further. We're going to line these things up in the middle. Notice they're lined up in the middle. Okay. Then we split the sister chromatids. Sister chromatids separate in anaphase. And then in telophase and cytokinesis, we'll get our four daughter cells. Come on. Okay, a little bit better picture here to see. Lined up in the center, sister chromatids have separated, and then our daughter cells are forming. Okay. Here's actually meiosis 2 going on in two lily cells. You can kind of see them starting to split here. Fascinating. Okay, so telophase 2, chromosomes have reached the poles of the cell. The nuclear envelope will form around each of the sets of chromosomes. With cytokinesis, we now have four haploid cells. So this might be a good place to pause and to take a break and you know, write your notes or, you know, write your summary, write your questions, and then come back. So mitosis and meiosis both begin with a diploid parent cell that have chromosomes that are duplicated. So that S phase is going to happen for both of these. 
hearing interface. However, the end products differ. That's a really important part. Mitosis provides two genetically identical diploid somatic daughter cells. So we go diploid to diploid. Now that candy in my mouth's not working. All right. And from meiosis, we get four genetically unique. So these are not the same. They're not identical. Okay, notice that they're identical for mitosis, but in meiosis, they're unique. And we get haploid gametes. So we start diploid, and we're going to end with haploid. That's the major part. That's a big part of this. Okay, so if we kind of look at it, we start off with maybe four chromosomes in our diploid parent cell. Okay, when we get to prophase one, our homologous chromosomes line up, so those that are similar come together, but those same ones in mitosis will kind of start to come together individually. They'll duplicate, and then their individual chromosomes will separate. And in metaphase, those sister chromatids line up in the middle, whereas in metaphase one, we get the homologous pairs lining up in the middle. Okay. Anaphase and telophase will split, and we get those two identical daughter cells, whereas already for meiosis one, at the end of anaphase one and telophase one, we have two separate, okay? We have two not identical um, daughter cells. But then we have to take it a little bit further with meiosis two, which will split those, so, so we do an extra step here. And so we separate those sister chromatids, and we get four unique, not identical daughter cells. Okay. All right. So one division of the nucleus and cytoplasm, our result is two genetically identical diploid. We use this for growth, repair, and sexual reproduction for mitosis. For meiosis, we have two divisions of the nucleus and cytoplasm. Result for genetically unique or different haploid cells only used for sexual reproduction. So that's our key there. So another thing that we'll cover really quickly, and then we'll probably kind of have to stop before the rest of it, but we get some kind of variation in there. We're looking for more varied possibilities for offspring. So genetic variation in gametes results from a couple of things, and this is another little thing to write down. We've got independent orientation at metaphase one and random fertilization, okay? This is also kind of, this is, to add to this, crossing over will help to increase our genetic variation. We didn't mention that before. So, but some other things that add this, so independent orientation, each pair of chromosomes independently, which means like, oh, well, chromosomes two lined up to the left, so I've got to line up to the left too. Not that at all. They independently align at the cell equator. There's an equal probability of a maternal or paternal chromosome facing a pole. So equal probability. The number of combination uh, of chromosomes packaged into gametes is 2n, where n is the haploid number of chromosomes. So you can imagine for humans, our possibilities are 2 to the 23rd. That's a lot. Here's math for you. 2 to the 23rd equals a lot. <laughs> Don't tell any of your math teachers I said that. All right, random fertilization means that combinations of each unique sperm with each unique egg increases genetic variation. Which egg and sperm kind of, well, more of like which sperm kind of unites with the egg and which egg is kind of chosen is random. So that kind of fertilization system is random. Okay, there's a video. We'll look at it. It's a good one. But here's two things. So let's say we have two, and this shows us our haploid number is two. So we're going to have four possibilities. So we could have, kind of I'll show you, but we could have both the kind of father ones lined up over here, or we could have a mix. Okay, from that, it'll be this way. Okay, so when they split through uh, metaphase two, or look at metaphase two, they'll look like that. By the time that we end, we'll have different combinations. So we could have this combination, this combination, this combination, or this combination. Okay, so that's 
that's kind of our two to the second. We have different combinations of how those could result, how our resulting gametes could be. Okay, because our, our gametes will have half of what the number is up here. So separation of homologous chromosomes during meiosis can lead to genetic differences between gametes. All right. Homologous chromosomes have much uh, have different versions of the same gene at that locus. So homologous chromosomes may have different versions of the gene. So let's say there's eye color, and this is an oversimplification. If if this there's a particular locus for eye color, and it's right here. Well, let's say that mom gave me the my mom gave me the genetics for blue eyes. So I would have that version here, but my dad had green eyes, so I got maybe the green eyes variation over here. So, you know, there's blue eyes from my mom and green eyes from my dad, but how that's expressed is a little different. So that's sort of what we're looking at. So one version was inherited from mom, the other from dad. Since homologous chromosomes move to opposite poles during anaphase one, Gametes will receive either maternal or paternal version of a gene, depending on how it works. Okay, so we've got them lined up here. Um, and you could sort of see what happens. That's not the best one, but here's a tetrad. So uh, this particular mouse is contributing a brown coat. So the coat color genes, those are dominant ones that we'll look at later, is contributing black eyes. Whereas this little guy down here is contributing a white coat and some pink eyes. He's a little albino. <laughs> okay. One more further kind of um, thing to add here is that genetic recombination is the production of new combinations of genes due to crossing over. So crossing over is an exchange of corresponding segments between non-sister chromatids. Okay. So non-sister chromatids join at a chiasma. Cosmata for two, on the side of attachment and crossing over. So corresponding amounts of genetic material are exchanged between the maternal and paternal chromatids. And it'll sort of, we'll play the video later, but it'll just be like, oh, a piece here and a piece here will switch. Okay, and it can happen maybe down here. Boop. So we're doing a little crossing over. We'll look at that one later. You can see it a little bit better here where we're crossing over at these points and some of that genetic material is becoming switched. So even this blue one down here now has some red attached to it. All right, so this is where we get a little bit of that kind of genetic variation. If we have big C, little c, big E, little e, well, when we do this, we're actually going to switch some. It's not obvious, but we're giving it an option in here with a big C and a little e instead. So we're switching out some of that. Okay, that's what's kind of showing us here. In the end, I have one option that has kind of the exact kind of dad appearance. Down here is exactly the mom appearance, or either way around. Uh, but this one is, either of these are kind of a blend, not exactly a blend, but a little bit of like um, material from both. So notice we've switched a little, so we've increased variation that much more. Okay, so parental type, parental type, and what we call recombinant for when they have both. And we've recombined them. Okay, so what we get into after this is a little bit of how we kind of mess those things up. But because we have gone to about 30 minutes, we're going to just touch on it a little bit. I'll give you this simple definition to start with is non-disjunction is the failure of chromosomes or chromatids to separate normally during meiosis. It can happen in phase one or phase two. So fertilization of non-disjunction yields zygotes with an altered number of chromosomes. That's all I'll give you on that one. Uh, we'll actually look at it later. I can sort of show you the picture. But notice they didn't separate quite right up here, so we've got abnormal numbers in that gamete. Okay, so uh, we'll talk about a karyotype. A karyotype will show you those. It's an ordered display of magnified images of those chromosomes arranged. We'll look at a chromosome or a karyotype a little bit later. 
I don't remember. That's what I like to do. We'll see if we can get to it. It's a good one. How they do it, it doesn't matter. We'll look at that. The only thing I want to give you is that because of this, this is one example of how this happens. It's called trisomy 21. When there's three copies inherited of chromosome 21, it's the most common human chromosome abnormality. You would know trisomy as in three chromosomes at position 21. You know that is Down syndrome. So of that, that's the example I want you to have. So with that, I'm going to try to stop here so that way you've got the, the basics of what's going on. And there's a lot, but you've got kind of the basics. So let's end there and do your best with that. And we'll talk about any other things that we might have missed a little bit later. I'll also note to you that unfortunately when I made this lecture two days ago, my computer froze. So if it happens that after this section something else weird comes up where I'm talking, it's because I had to edit because my computer froze mid-lecture last time. So my bad. Deal with it. This is the stopping point. Whatever I say afterwards, who knows? Don't believe me. No, I'm just kidding. But I don't know what it has to do with. So there it is. We're done. So our goal is to get five.